Well, thank you so much for joining us. We don't know your situation. Maybe you're just out of town and couldn't be worshiping with us in person. Uh, Maybe you have health issues that force you uh, to be able to worship from home. Or maybe you are one of those that's very concerned about the current situation with COVID-19. Or maybe you just are joining us from another location that you wanted to check out Woodmont Baptist Church and and, and see what God is doing here and in our midst. And, and so whatever your case may be, we are thankful that you're here. We're honored to have you with us. And, and I pray that you will find this to be encouraging. So thank you for joining us And I'm going to pray for you now. God, thank you again for these people that are joining us. Father, for each and every person. Father, we praise you for them. We praise you for their intentional effort, Lord, to hear the word, to be under the teaching of the word. And Father, I pray, God, that by your spirit, the word would change their life, change their heart forever, God, and and that they would know that their salvation is in the name Jesus. God, I pray that as we go forward in our worship service, that as we join together and worship the Lord Jesus, Father, that our hearts would be together, though separated by distance. Father, we could be united under the Spirit of God. Father, we pray for each person that's watching, Lord. I pray, God, that you would bless them. I pray that you would minister to them and that uh, Woodmont Baptist Church could minister to them. And Father, most of all, I pray that we they know that they are loved, first by you, And second of all, by me, God, we just thank you so much uh, for who you are and how you've saved us and redeemed us from our sin and our shame and given us eternal life in your presence. Father, we love you. We praise you. And again, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of the service.
thank you that you revealed the mystery. The plan that you had already put together before the foundation of the world. That Jesus, the spotless lamb, would hang on a cross in our place. Words are inadequate today. To tell you, God, how, how much we love you. And the gratitude that is within us because of what you have done for us. And we pray today, Lord Jesus, that all that we do, the worship that we offer you today, would be pleasing to you. 
And God, from the hearts of the weak to the shouts of the strong, that your name would be praised in this place today. We stand in need, broken, disabled by sin, but oh so grateful for the power of the cross, the power of the resurrection that has redeemed us. And we wait for the day that we stand before you blameless and complete, lacking nothing, to worship you for all eternity. And God, if there's someone in this place today that is unsure that they will stand before you, God, would you draw them close to you today? Would you draw us all, God, to your throne of grace? We love you today and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we mentioned this last week, but the marriage retreat for Woodmont couples, couples is August 13th and 14th. And I actually think we have a video to show right now. My name is Seth Hood. I'm the senior pastor at First Baptist Church, Colbert Heights. And I'm excited to be with you for your marriage retreat, August 13th and 14th. On Friday night, we're going to talk about a biblical definition of love and how to love your spouse the way that God loves them. On Saturday morning, we're going to dive deep into the soul connection of a marriage, how to be soulmates. And we're going to talk about a spiritual depth in your marriage that will help you reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you'll join us. Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our flesh carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children of wrath as the others were also. But God, he was rich in mercy because of his great love that he had loved, had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display his immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Let us make Jesus our vision today and all that he has done for us. Let's not substitute anything today for him. Let's put him at the center, the high king of heaven deserves that today. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Would you stand with me? Let's lift our voices together.
Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us. And now as we turn to our time of teaching the scripture and just learning from what God would teach us from that, we, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13 as we wrap up this series, the Sermon of uh, the Summer of Love. And we are focusing in on 1 Corinthians 13. And this, this will wrap up that chapter as we look at verses 8 through 13. Now, I do want to tell you that the story goes that um, Mark Twain, he, he loved to fish. He loved to go fishing, but actually what was happening is that he loved relaxing. He hated catching fish. See, he he wanted to go fishing so that nobody would bother him and that every time he catched a fish, he had to figure out what to do with it. He had to figure out what he should do, where should he put it, how did he get it off the hook, all those kind of things. So both being interrupted by people bothered him, being at work bothered him, and also catching fish bothered him. And so he developed a creative way to go about this. And that creative way to go about this and solve all these issues was that he would go sit by a creek bank or by a river bank and he would put in, he would have a fishing pole, he'd have the line, he'd have the the whole setup, he'd have the bobber on the line and everything, but he would not attach a hook. And so he'd throw it out there and he would just sit and relax and nobody would bother Mark Twain because they thought he was fishing and they didn't want to disturb him or disturb the fish that they thought he was fishing for. And actually the whole time he was looking for a spot to relax. Now I want to tell you this, that sometimes you can see somebody doing something, you can know them and know who they are. And you can understand that what they're doing is not matching up. Maybe you only see the surface. And in a day of technology like we have today, it's easy to put things on our Facebook and our social media and all of our accounts that make us look one way. In reality, we are something very, very different. And so today, as we look at the scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, what we're going to see is that God has given us some snapshots, some portraits of what is to come, but yet they they hell in comparison to what is to be revealed at the coming of Christ. And that's what he's trying to teach us. And so as we dive into the word, I pray that you would be encouraged. We want to read the word before we get started. And we want to know what the word says. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8 through 13, here's what it says. It says, love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside the childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. But then, face to face, now I know in part. But then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And so as you read through those verses, I hope that you are encouraged to know that God's love for you exists for all eternity. That the greatest of these is love and faith, hope, and love. They extend for all eternity and all times in the future. Now, what's happening at Corinth is quite different. And so as we dive in, we're going to look at what remains. And we're going to see how Paul is teaching the church at Corinth to put aside their selfish ambition, to put aside their selfish divisions, to put aside the division that has come upon them in regards to the spiritual gifts, and instead focus on what endures forever. And so we're going to look at what remains. But in order to set that context, we have to know, and we'll we'll borrow from our friend John MacArthur, but we'll borrow from him when it says this. It says, they were opposed to loving each other because they were so devoted to raising their own flag. Now, I don't know about you, but I know we have plenty of people that want to raise their own flag on secondary and tertiary issues inside the church. And this leads ultimately to divisions. Instead of uniting under the banner of Christ, instead of uniting as Jehovah Nissi under his banner, then what we do instead is that we become uh, preoccupied with secondary and tertiary issues that do not matter ultimately for all eternity. And so what happens is that we become divided and the enemy wins by sending in these issues to divide us and part us in where there should be some charity on both sides. And so this is what was happening at Corinth. It says they were so devoted to raising their own flag. This is a tragic situation in a church. When people are competing rather than loving, when they are proud rather than humble, and as I told you last time, only humble people love. Only humble people love. 
That's the quote from John MacArthur. And I think it brings true that, that we should know that only humble people truly do love others. Because as Paul writes in Philippians, that we must think of others as better than ourselves. We must take the very attitude of Jesus Christ. And so we have to see here that this number one point, it says, Why is love greater than the gifts? Why love is greater than the spiritual gifts that are given to us by the Holy Spirit? There's been some debate uh, over the time in, in Christian history of what is more important, the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And obviously, it needs to have the fruit of the Spirit within using the gifts of the Spirit. And so this is what it says, why love is greater than the gifts. Go back to verse 8. It says, love never ends. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. And so we have to understand that what Paul is teaching here is that while they are making such a big deal about the spiritual gifts they have and bringing division, they're not focusing in on what lasts forever. I love what Warren Wiersbe says, and we'll go to that. It says this, the Corinthians were like children playing with toys that would one day disappear. And if you know Warren Wiersbe, you know his wisdom into the word, but, but he pulls this out and he shows us this truth that that they were like kids. They were fighting over which one had the better toy, which one had the better thing. And little did they know that all these would cease, all these spiritual gifts instead, that we would see Jesus face to face one day. And so he reminds the church, he says, love never ends, but prophecies, they will come to an end. Tongues, they will cease, right? For knowledge, it will come to an end. And so what happens here is that Paul elevates love and he puts the spiritual gifts in their proper context and in their proper usage for the church. Now, I do want to tell you that this does bring up an interesting passage because this passage is one of those that has caused great division on a secondary issue. And, and this issue basically is, does the, do the spiritual gifts cease to exist at some time? And so you have some on one side, uh, you have the cessationalist and you have the continuationist and, and theological perspectives. And basically you can look across the spectrums on this secondary issue, but here's what the central question is. The central question in the charismatic debate is this, and, and I just wanna remind you that that word charismatic is not referring to a certain church. Instead, what it is, is that the Greek word for spiritual gifts is charismata. And so what we see is that this charismatic debate, this debate about the gifts that have been given by the Spirit is, is this. So the central question among this debate is this. Were these gifts intended by God to be used throughout the entire church age until the Lord returns? And so you would see that simply the cessationalists say, no, these gifts ceased. So there are certain miraculous gifts like knowledge, like prophecy, like speaking in tongues, healings, miracles. Some would say those cease to exist. And by that, what they mean is this. Simply they mean that there are no longer miracle workers. There are no longer healers. There are no longer those who prophesy. And so what we have to see is that they understand that the perfect to come was the perfect word of God. And so when the canon was closed, they said that these gifts have ceased now to exist and that they were used typically, uh, typically through the time in the early church to authenticate those who were really apostles of Jesus Christ. Now, on the other side of this spectrum in, in theological perspectives, you have who are known as the continuationists. And the continuationists would answer this question, were these gifts intended by God to be used throughout the entire church age until the Lord returns? They would say yes that there are still prophecies, but they have to be consistent with Scripture. There, uh, I, would be caution, I would caution anybody to think that the Holy Spirit just speaks to somebody and presents new truth on equal footing as the Word of God. I think that's a very dangerous and, and very um, un, unwise practice. And so we will see that throughout Scripture, how that plays out and, and the cautions that is throughout the New Testament about those type of revelations. But the continuationists would say, yes, all these gifts will continue until the Lord Jesus comes, until the perfect is what in 1 Corinthians 13, continuation would look and say, what it's referring to is the return of Jesus. And so again, these are it's a secondary issue. You may be a cessationalist and you may be sitting next to a continuationist and, and you may be worshiping with a body of continuationists or with a body of cessationalists. And that will imply some differences in, in some things as part of the worship. But I just want to give you the grace to know that this is a secondary issue. I also 
will be honest with you on where I am with this, this issue. And that is that I am a missionary continuous. Meaning this, that I believe that on the mission field is where we see some of these gifts most prominently. And that if we were engaged in, in an in a unreached people group, if we were engaged with them, we may see some of the works that are spoken of in the book of Acts and things like that. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, which we'll cover in the coming weeks, but it says simply that prophecy is for the church, for the believers, and the gift of tongues is for unbelievers. And so it makes sense that if we were working with an unreached people group who spoke a different language, we may see a pouring of the, uh, the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts in that direction. And so anyway, so that's, that's where I am. But again, I would always filter that through the Word of God. And so then you go on. So let's look at the unity, the agreement, even though there may be differences among those two camps we can see the agreement among the believers and the agreement among both of those ends of the spectrum is this that the holy spirit is at work in this world oh be confident brother or sister be confident that the holy spirit is still doing a great work among us the holy spirit is still moving the third person of the trinity is still working and doing a great work and every time somebody comes to know jesus as the lord and savior then that is a work of the holy spirit that should be applauded and celebrated by the body of believers the holy spirit supernaturally works in human hearts to bring people to the point of faith in christ as i was just saying the holy spirit is doing great work in the, in the um, lives of people as they become as they exchange the shame and the death of sin for the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ, that they are forgiven and have life eternal. Another thing that both, both ends of that spectrum would agree on is that the Holy Spirit gives certain gifts to people to carry out ministry, such as teaching, preaching, administration, and hospitality. So those that are cessationalists, they say some gifts still continue through the church age until the return of Jesus. And these gifts include service, preaching, teaching, hospitality, encouragement, others that continue to go on. But as for the miraculous, they've ceased. But the continuationists would say all gifts have continued on. And so there's an agreement that one day all gifts will cease as Christ returns. And then there's disagreement on some of the gifts that have already passed away or have they or not. And then God can and does at times miraculously intervene in the affairs of people. I want to remind you today that if you know a cessationalist or if you are a cessationalist, you still need to pray for miracles. You still need to pray because you believe God still intervenes and does the miraculous. And so I would just unite us among these things and remind us again what Warren Wearsby says. That the Corinthians were like children playing with toys that would one day disappear. And that you would know that truth that, that we don't put our hope in the gifts or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We put our hope in Jesus Christ, the work of redemption brought about by Jesus Christ. And so we hold to that as our salvation and we are saved by faith, right? We're saved by grace through faith, not by works so that no one can boast. And I want to just remind you again of these passages that teach us of the importance of reading the word and, and discerning. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24 says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with content, but test them all. Again, so if you are more of a continuationist and you see this, then understand what the word is saying. It's saying this, that you must use the word of God to measure anything that somebody says to you that says they are speaking on behalf of God. One of the things that I hope you do every time I preach the Word of God is that I hope you measure it against the Word of God and that you would see, hopefully, that we are showing ourselves as one approved, a workman approved by God who correctly handles the Word of truth. So he says this, he says, Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. In 1 John 4, 1 through 3, we also get another uh, warning to us about making sure that we're filtering everything through the word of God. And it says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. 
because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus Christ is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. See, sometimes we speak of that as if it's to come, but John tells us it's already here. That spirit is already here. And then it says this in 1 John 4, 4 through 5. It says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Listen to this, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. But be reminded of John 10 when it says that the sheep know the shepherd's voice and we listen to the great shepherd. And so I hope that anything that is said to you, you would always listen through the word of God, through the spirit of God, and you would listen for them pointing all things to Jesus Christ and acknowledging him as the son of God who brings about salvation only in his name. And it's not by works. And so then that leads us not only to understand and to know this picture of of what is happening in the body of believers at Corinth, but then it says why why growth is significant. We must know why growth is significant spiritually. That, That the Word wants us to become spiritually mature, that the Lord desires that in our life, that we would produce fruit as mature believers in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 10, he goes on to say this. He says, For we know in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. Now I want you to think about Paul who has labored so much for this body of believers in Corinth. I want you to think about all the missionary journeys and all the things that he has done to try to bring the gospel to them, but also to bring them up in the gospel. And while we see all these divisions and all these issues in 1 Corinthians, we must be reminded that there is a book called 2 Corinthians. And the good news is, is that the body of believers there at Corinth listened to the directions of Paul, and Paul is able to write them another letter telling them how proud he is of them, of the way that they have handled themselves since the first letter. And so we see this movement to maturity. In Colossians, Paul's trying to talk to the church at Coloss, and he says this, he says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant, listen, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. See, Paul had no desire just to be sent by God and present only a partial gospel. Instead, what he says is, I'm coming to you to present the whole gospel, that I'm coming to you to present the full word of God. And this is so important that we present as pastors to you, as leaders to you, the full counsel of the word of God. And then he goes on, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. And he's speaking about Jesus and that revelation there. He goes on to write, He says, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. And catch this last part. Listen to this desire for the maturity in the church. It says, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I don't know if you've been watching the Olympics, but it's incredible to watch all the the energy that is used by these Olympic athletes to try to reach the goal, to try to press on, to try to achieve these gold medals or silver medals or bronze medals. And they're trying to be the best in the world. And Paul says, I've suffered all these things so that I may present you. You're the, you're, you're the objects that he's trying to present you in complete maturity to Christ Jesus. And so this is what he tries to do. And to this end, he strenuously contends with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. In Philippians 1.6, Paul writes, he says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Good news, your sanctification is continuing every day of your life. 
And what Jesus has started inside of you, if you're a believer, is continuing and continuing and continuing. And so the good news is, is that when we go back through 1 Corinthians 13, if, if we're not those people that, that are just loving unconditionally and that we're being kind and patient, all that kind of stuff, is that the sanctification is still taking place and the Lord is working on us and bringing about what He started to completion and maturity in our lives until the day of Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13, Paul writes, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. And why did he give them? To equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In Hebrews 6, 1-3, the author writes, Therefore let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. And so I hope you hear the heart of Paul, that he is aiming for the spiritual growth, that he's aiming not to celebrate the the gifts that won't remain, but instead he is celebrating and pointing out the, the things that will actually last for all eternity. And he's telling the Corinthians, grow in faith, grow in hope, grow in love, because these things will endure for all time. It doesn't matter what what gift God has given you. He's ultimately given you that to build up the church, to present it to maturity. And so use those things to present the, the believers mature in Christ. But do not allow those gifts to be the things that cause division and cause the, 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 the love that is shared between believers to be divisive. And so I would just remind you as, as a pastor and as a leader that, that we need to look and understand that this is why love is greater than the gifts. And that's what we need to be striving for. And we strive for that by growing spiritually in Christ. I would remind you at this point that without Christ, you can do nothing, right? John 15, that we need to abide in Christ to bear much fruit and that without him, we cannot. And so we have to understand that this is all coming from Christ. And then this is point number three, why we hope for eternity. Listen what he says in verse 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. So this is one of those areas that that you see that he's actually looking for the personal coming of Jesus Christ. That one day we will see him face to face. It's a reminder, it takes us back to Exodus 33, when it says that Moses met the Lord in a tent of meeting, and they met, Moses met with God as a person meets with a friend face to face. There's another passage in John 15, 15, that the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I no longer call, call you servants, but now I call you friends. I hope you understand that God has come so that we can have a relationship with him, that we are friends of Christ Jesus, that he adopts us as his brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we get to join in being joint heirs of Jesus Christ. And this is why we hope for eternity. We hope for the eternal, right? Because we see him one day face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. I want to show you this picture real quick. Here you see some different phases of the moon. And what you can see here is is the different phases as the sun's reflection reflects off the moon. And the reason we have different phases of the moon is simply that because the earth gets in the way, right? There's this moment where the earth gets in the way of the sun and so the sun's reflection on the moon cannot be seen and that's what we call a new moon when the moon is not visible. But then we have a full moon when when the sun is fully able to show the reflection on the moon back to us. And so we see this. And the picture is for us as believers is to know that what Paul is writing to us here is for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face is to hope and to to hold on to the hope that, that though we cannot see him clearly now, one day we will. That these gifts are just given to us 
so that we'll see a glimpse of what is to come when Christ returns. That we see a glimpse of His goodness by the way we exercise our gifts in unity to build up the church. That we will be wanting to be mature when Christ comes and calls us home. Because we will want to see and be worshiping Him and, and, and seeing our faith becoming sight before us. And so we hope for eternity and we will not let the world get in the way of us reflecting Jesus Christ. I pray that you know that. I pray that when people see our church or see you as the believer, see me as the believer, they would hopefully see a reflection of Jesus Christ. But to be honest, there are times in my life when I don't see clearly Jesus to reflect because the earth, the world, gets in the way. I become distracted. I become one that is looking at other things or desiring other things besides just the Lord. I become distracted maybe by worries of life or anxieties in life. And instead of casting them on the Lord because He cares for me, instead of do not worrying because I can see how He cares for the birds in the air, I can see how He clothes the flowers of the field, instead of seeing all that, instead I let the world become a distraction and then I don't reflect Him well. And this is what Paul is pointing to. He says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. I love what, what was said by R.L. Platt Jr. He says this, for Paul, the gifts of the Spirit are the photographs the church has access to now. When Christ returns, however, then everyone will see face to face. Everything of which the gifts now speak in part will then be revealed in full, just as a reflected image outlives its usefulness when the thing it portrays can be seen face to face. The gifts will also have outlived their usefulness when perfection comes at Christ's return. I just can't wait. I, I think about the relationship with Jesus Christ. I think about how much I love him. And, and I think about how he's given us this incredible creation to see him and to know him. And that we could see his invisible attributes at that time. We could, we could see the attributes of God. We could see his div divinity. We could see his eternal power just by what he's created. I think about the redemptive history of the Old Testament and thinking about how he led Moses to go rescue the Israelites and, and get them out of Egypt and, and he led them faithfully through the wilderness. I think about all the miracles he did. I think about the bronze snake that was lifted high and then Jesus comes and, and teaches that the bronze snake is actually a representation of who he is and that Jesus was going to be lifted high and we could be healed of our sin and our shame in Jesus when we look at Jesus and believe him. I think about all the, the redemptive history of the Old Testament of the Passover lamb and, and to think about how those bones were broken, the blood was poured out. I think about Jesus and, and how he was broken for us and how his blood was spilled out on the cross of Jesus, on the cross of Calvary, so that we may have life. I think about all the prophets who were proclaiming that Jesus was going to come, that he was coming, the Messiah was coming, and he was going to come humbly into Bethlehem. And then you get to the New Testament and you see this babe wrapped in, in swaddling clothes. And you see him and you believe this is the Son of God. You see the rejoicing of the shepherds and the angels. You see Anna and, and, and Simeon at the temple prophesying over this child and, and then to think about seeing him on the cross to think about seeing all the pain and everything he went through so that we may have life and that we may have it abundantly and we think about all the price that he paid that he absorbed the whole wrath of God so that we we could could be known that there be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I think about the sacrifice that he made. I think about when he rose from the dead and the disciples were there. I think about John and Peter running to the tomb and, and then proclaiming Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. I think about Thomas and how he how he doubted that, that Jesus was alive. And he says, I won't believe until I see those scars in his hands and, and, the, and the wounds on his side. And then Jesus shows up and says, come see oh i think about that but that will all pair in comparison to what is coming for us that jesus christ one day we will see him and we will have the opportunity to bow down before him and lay our crowns at his feet and say thank you jesus thank you for your salvation thank you for saving me thank you for rescuing me thank you thank you thank you 
This is what Charles Spurgeon was talking about when he said, Illumine these dark senses. Waken this drowsy conscience. Purify my heart. Give me fellowship with Christ. And then bear me up. Translate me to the third heaven so that I may, so I can, so I shall see God. Oh, the, the longing that we have to see God and to see him face to face without this flesh that holds us back. In 1990. NASA started a, a new telescope program called the Hubble Telescope. And the Hubble Telescope has produced some amazing pictures like this. And you see the incredible depth and, and just what our, our minds could barely even take in as what exists in outer space and in the universe that God has created. And again, how they point back to his eternal power and his divine nature. And we see that from some of these pictures and, and just the creativity of our God who has created a world of order, not of chaos, but of order. And, and the fact that we have laws and, and we can work on these laws on how we can get to space. And you've seen all the space race among the billionaires to get up into space and, and to do this. And they're all following laws of nature. But the Lord has given us a universe that, that cannot be operated. And we see it and can be studied because he's a God of order, as 1 Corinthians 14 says. But did you know that the first pictures from the Hubble telescope were actually disappointing to a lot of people? In 1990, when the first picture came back, you see it over here, this far picture. You see that it's awful blurry and, and maybe it's not as clear. And then they did some computer work and some editing and it comes a little clearer over here. But, but people were disappointed. In fact, comedians were making jokes about how Hubble rhymed with trouble and, and it was all this stuff. But to be honest, what was wrong with the Hubble telescope was it had a faulty mirror. The mirror could not handle what it was asked to do. There was a faultiness in its creation. And I would just suggest to you that as we look through a mirror, we see things dimly. They look blurry. We can't fathom all the deep truths of Christ. We have trouble seeing, but one day when the perfect comes, we will see face to face. We will, be, we will know fully as we are fully known by him who loved us. And so we have this hope, and this leads us to point number four, and that is what remains. And 1 Corinthians says this in verse 13 of chapter 13. It says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. So it's appropriate that today we started out with the controversial issue of cessationalist and continuationist. And we started talking about the division in Corinth among the spiritual gifts and, and prophecy being greater, tongues being greater, and how they would show off their spiritual gifts and all this kind of stuff in Corinth. And Paul is leading them back to the truth. And I would ask you today, are you focusing on Jesus above all things? Are you still making the main thing the main thing? Or have you gotten hijacked by some secondary or tertiary doctrine? Or maybe you've gotten hijacked by some secondary or tertiary issue in your life that you're distracted and you have turned away from the Lord and you have forgotten that these three will remain for all time. Faith, hope, and love in Christ Jesus. I pray that today whatever you, has your attention that the Lord would captivate your attention completely and that he would hold it and that you would be reminded he loves you. He laid down his life for you and that the, there is hope in his name. And all the struggles that we see as we look through this lens and it's, it's dimly, all the trouble we see as we look through this mirror and we see a reflection of what was to be and all this kind of stuff. One day the perfect will come and we will see him face to face. He's given us plenty of signs to remind us that he's coming. And those signs have been revealed time and time again. And so I would ask you, are you ready for his return? Are you faithful to the Lord Jesus? And when he comes, Will you be waiting for him instead of focusing on something else? Let us not be like the Corinthians 
and be like children playing with toys that will disappear. Instead, let us be faithful soldiers of our commanding officer and let us await his appearing. Let us be good stewards of the one that has given us so much because he will come back to investigate and how we have stewarded the talents that he has put in our care. May we build up the church together, believers. And if you're not a believer, I pray that right now you would turn your life over to the one who is coming back and he's returning and he will investigate those who are the sheep that are faithful and following him and those that are the goats that will be separated forever. Let's pray together. God, we love you. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your kindness to us. We thank you for the gospel. And Father, we pray for each and every person that listened and heard the word. And God, I pray that you would remind us that you love us. And God, that you have prepared a place for us. And Father, we pray, God, that we would be ready and that we'd be found in your service at your return. And we ask this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. We love you. Thank you very much and God bless you.